good evening i welcome all of you to the 37th lecture of archaeological sciences center webinar series today we have with us uh, professor parul pandya dhar of delhi university uh, who will be delivering the talk uh, on on southeast asian and indian connections and uh, i'm i'm also glad to inform you that we have completed uh, three years we started in 2020 uh, october and last month we completed uh, uh, three years and uh, this is the first talk of the fourth year and we we are uh, happy to have professor uh, parul pandya dhar with us and i uh, thank uh, professor for sparing your time from your busy schedule to deliver us a talk and now i request uh, unka to introduce the speaker and after that uh, the talk will commence good afternoon everyone Welcome to the thirty seventh lecture of the AEC webinar series. Our distinguished, the distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Parul Pandyadhar, a renowned scholar in the field of art history, will guide us through a fascinating journey today. Dr. Parul Pandyadhar is a professor of art history in the Department of History, University of Delhi. Her work focuses on the history and historiography of Indian art and connected histories of Indian and Southeast Asian cultures. She has authored and edited several volumes. Most recently, connected histories of India and Southeast Asia, icons, narratives, monuments, and the multivalence of an epic re retelling the Ramayan in South India and Southeast Asia. She is currently working on a monograph on artists and art practices in the Deccan, and also writes a monthly column, Ways of Seeing, for the Economic Times. Today's talk is entitled Towards a Connected Ar Connected Art History of India and Southeast Asia. and the talk focuses the uh, focus of the talk is to interpret an attempt to conceptualize the nature of artistic dialogue between india and southeast asia spe specifically the ways in which interactions are observed through the prisms of monumental and sculptural art icons narratives and monuments belonging to the second half of the first millennium ce uh, so before we embark on this enriching journey of knowledge i would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to professor Dar for gracing us with her time today, and uh, with this, ma'am, you may uh, begin the slides. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for this generous introduction, and uh, very grateful to the IIT Gandhi Nagar uh, uh, scholars and teachers, students, for inviting me as part of the. Uh, lecture series organized by the Archaeological Sciences Center. Congratulations for entering the fourth year, and uh, you've been uh, giving us uh, an excellent series. Thank you, Dr. Prabhakar, uh, especially for your uh, interest in the subject of connected histories of India and Southeast Asia, and uh, for uh, taking this initiative and uh, inviting me. to deliver a talk in this prestigious uh, series um essentially i will of course be looking at uh, connections in pre modern india and southeast asia through the lens of visual culture specifically sculpture and architecture and uh, therefore i choose to call it connected art histories uh my focus will be intra asian connections in ancient and early medieval period and uh, so that the emphasis is on establishing some ways of looking at these connected histories through um, visual culture remains uh, this this essentially is the focus now uh, as uh, members Uh, in the 21st century of what one may call a very globalized world a global community that is accustomed to instant worldwide networks uh, it does take a degree of historical imagination to comprehend the nature of communication systems that uh, brought pre modern asian societies and cultures in close contact and one is talking of millennia old connections now uh, these cultures of ancient and medieval india and southeast asia have in fact been participants in 
a very rich trans regional cultural dialogue uh, you know objects ideas knowledge systems uh, through trade through religious contacts uh, and other means so uh, today's central focus as i said is the dissemination of artistic knowledge between the two regions on either side of the bay of bengal or the eastern indian ocean if we like to say and my specific time focus will be between the 6th and the 12th centuries uh, ad a period that is usually referred to as the early medieval in south asian uh, history now interactions between early india and uh, southeast asia traversed the tangible domain of uh, goods and material culture but also uh, the intertwined exchanges relating to ideas knowledge systems beliefs and practices long distance material uh, and human migrations transpired on account of a variety of reasons uh, where that we may like to group broadly uh, uh, you know on account of some major reasons say for example pilgrimage trade war diplomacy and uh, as we shall see ahead much more Um, often the tangible and intangible domains were inextricably connected so that these are conceptual categories as far as uh, you know dividing them into tangible and intangible is concerned and uh, the human connect uh, was at at the center of all these uh, manifestations now talking from an art historian's perspective the visuality of early cultural encounters between india and southeast asia attained maturity a certain diversity and complexity from let's say about the 5th 6th centuries of the common era although connections and connected histories go much further back but we are talking of a certain complexity and maturity in the available a uh, material culture and visual domains that an art historian engages with so interpreting the resultant imagery brings to focus a complex web of relationships between the two culture larger cultural zones of contact it is for us important then to examine possible meanings that may be read of cross interactions now that brings us to the important uh, subject of cross cultural histories of art so cross cultural histories of art move beyond the limits imposed by regional and political boundaries to investigate and conceptualize interrelationships between uh, art forms uh that belong to very diverse spatial cultural and temporal zones so apart from more basic issues relating to meaning in the visual arts several additional concerns arise in cross cultural contexts and Uh, these concerns require analytical frameworks that could help a culturally established symbol motif form object or monument found in one culture which finds resonance in a distant culture but then difference as well as similarity across a wide range of shared art concepts themes languages and forms in india and southeast asia for example requires a very systematic interpretation so we are not talking of transplants we are talking of uh, cross cultural interactions resulting not just in transference of ideas but transformation and localization uh, of uh, what 
transpires as a dialogue. So some crucial questions require to be addressed in the process. Uh, let's say, how does the transmission of concepts and forms in regions? Why are some themes more widely propagated than others? What are the shifts in meanings associated with processes of localization? And in what ways does iconographic transference add to our understandings of the distinctiveness as well as similarity of two or more cultures in conversation? And finally, is it possible to track roots of transmission of ideas and cultures in conversation. Uh, these are some of the concerns and while not all questions raised here may be possible to answer and answer convincingly in the, in the given time frame, this, these are the larger questions that guide uh, what follows. Um, religious images uh, largely, uh, but other kinds of images too, whether carved or molded or painted uh, on portable objects, were carried long, long ago by pilgrims, traders, priests, and monks on long distance journeys by land and sea uh, across the Eastern Indian Ocean, the Java Sea, the South China Sea. Uh, the Malacca Straits, uh, the Gulf of Thailand, and, and so on. Uh, often, even political embassies uh, between these regions in the ancient and medieval kingdoms uh, included gifts, often images of deities, Buddhist and Hindu, which were sent as goodwill gestures from the court of one king to another. We read in the Chinese annals, especially of embassies bringing tributes that included images of the Buddha and so on. Uh, beyond peaceful migrations, conflict and war led to the dispersal of architectural vocabulary as well. Often, the most sacred icon established in a temple of the enemy was looted and carried away as war booty. And contrary to our belief that this only happened in medieval India, we have examples of this in uh, as early as the 7th, 8th century in Southeast Asia as well, uh, relating to both Hindu and Buddhist uh, icons. Um, so, I'd like to pose three broad pillars uh, in how we can understand the dispersal of artistic imagery and its localization. Uh, the first relates to the actual movement of objects and artifacts across land and sea through trade, war, and other transfers that played an important role in shaping the Hindu and Buddhist pantheons of Southeast Asia. The second is the impact of texts, mythology, and prescriptions relating to image making in aiding fresh visualizations uh, of religious icons and visual narratives. So what you see on the screen are portable objects like terracotta ceilings, a bronze sculpture of uh, the Buddha in Amaravati style, but actually made in Sri Lanka that was found off the coast of uh, central Vietnam in a region called Dongzon. And then you see a votive stupa, the likes of which, not exactly this one, but the likes of which traveled these long distances and disseminated uh, artistic and architectural vocabulary. Also uh, included in the mediation of the portable object that we've been talking about, are manuscripts, illustrated manuscripts that carried not just religious ideas and uh, prescriptions, but also artistic imagery, like you see the temple and the, and the sculptural 
icon in front of it in this Pragna Paramita manuscript that is today located in the university library in uh, Cambridge. So these are representative examples to, to indicate the kind of portable objects that carried artistic ideas across uh, long distances. So beyond the portable objects and the artifacts uh, that one has been talking about, uh, the, the, and the impact of texts, manuscripts, mythology, and prescriptions. The third very important aspect is the local imagery, beliefs and practices in fashioning newer iconographies. So it's often the local agency, the most important factor that gets neglected in conceptualizing cross-cultural histories of uh, art. Uh, in what follows, what I'm going to do is take up specific examples from the history of uh, connections between the two regions. Uh, one icon uh, for which I have chosen Bodhisattva Lokiteshwara, one narrative for which I would like to take up the Ramayana epic, and finally then one example of architectural transference, both in terms of concept and in terms of act, the actual materiality uh, conveying architectural forms and ideas to dis distant lands. So coming to the icon uh, the, uh, of uh, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshwara, who actually became as uh, important whose worship and cult became as important in Southeast Asia as the Buddha himself. Um, it is important to know that his iconography was carried also on portable objects like this. And uh, he was a very important icon as far as travel of sailors and merchants is concern. I'll come to that in a little while. But, uh, but before that, uh, let me tell you in general about the importance of Avalokiteshvara in Southeast Asia. So with the spread of Buddhism from India to large parts of Asia, the very humane and compassionate appeal of Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara as the ultimate embodiment of deliverance, of protection, and of course of compassion, made him increasingly popular for worship in Southeast Asia. While the beginnings of the concept of Avalokiteshvara in Buddhism has been traced by scholars to a much earlier date, it is only during the 6th century AD that the iconography of Avalokiteshvara as a savior from worldly perils and disasters gained greater significance. Avalokiteshvara's compassionate and protective qualities emerge. Um, excuse me, I have a message saying that there is a time lag. Yeah, uh, if you can switch off like, the video. Uh, should I switch off? Should I switch off the yeah. video? Yeah, please. Yes, yes, please. All right, all right. And keep the screen on. Is, is yeah, that yes. possible? Yeah. Does this work? Yeah, sure. All right. Okay. So this this uh, this should help hopefully uh, in reducing the time lag. Now, Avalokiteshvara's compassionate and protective qualities emerge clearly in Buddhist texts such as the Sadharma Pundarika Sutra and the Karanda Vyuha Sutra. Uh, scholars like Nandana Chutivongs have traced the spread of Avalokiteshvara cult and iconography across mainland Southeast Asia in great detail. Her research highlights patterns of assimilation of this imagery in Southeast Asia from about the 7th century AD. So although based on Indian prototypes, local beliefs in each of the Southeast Asian regions, be it Champa to your left or Sri Lanka, an image in the center, the Vergal uh, Avalokiteshvara. Uh, you have different iconographies of Avalokiteshvara uh, evolving there. 
while the Theravada tradition in Myanmar and Central Thailand discouraged superhuman forms in Avalokiteshvara iconography, that is, multiple heads, multiple arms, etc., places like Champa in present-day Vietnam and Cambodia, where Shaivism was the dominant state religion, developed elaborate larger-than-life iconographies of Avalokiteshvara. As Lokeshwara or Lokanatha, the lord or the protector of the people, Avalokiteshvara's status at times rose to that of a state cult expressed in monumental art and architecture from which the king who adopted Avalokiteshvara as the patron deity of the state or the kingdom uh, derived authority and legitimacy. So, for example, at Dongzong in Champa in the late 9th, early 10th centuries, during the reign of King Indravarman II, uh, for some reason, can you see this slide? From Dongzong, two bronze images. Yeah, 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 we can see. Yeah. Uh, so, King Indra, Jaya Indravarman II, for example, adopted, broke from the tradition of using Shiva as the patron deity, the linga of Shiva as the patron deity, to adopting Avalokiteshvara as the patron deity of his uh, kingdom in uh, the city of Indrapura, which is located in the present-day Kwangnam province of central uh, Vietnam. Now, along with the significance of Avalokiteshvara's iconic presence in the religion, ritual, and politics of Southeast Asia, another important dimension to the popularity and propagation of this Bodhisattva relates to trade. His role as the protector of sailors, merchants, and traders, and as the healer of the sick and drowned, downtrodden, finds mention both in the Saddharma Pundarika Sutra and the Karanda Vyuha Sutra. So this iconography to the right is that of uh, the Ashta Mahabhayaloki Teshwara. What you see uh, is an image from Cave 7 Aurangabad in the Western Deccan. And the image of a standing Avalokiteshvara with a, with a beautiful lotus on a long lotus stalk and the gesture of abhaya or fearlessness is accompanied with eight smaller images carrying narratives on either side. And you see in each image, of, uh, an image of a small image of Avalokiteshvara rescuing people from the eight great fears, what is known as the Ashta Mahabhaya. Uh, so here you see, for example, to your, uh, to your uh, left top portion, uh, in case anything is mismatched, please do tell me between my voice and the image. You see to the, uh, to the top left, uh, Avalokiteshvara rescuing people from the great fear or Mahabhaya of fire. The second one down here is rescuing from uh, an attack by the enemy. Uh, the third one below it is uh, just a minute. Rescuing from uh, captivity. The one at the bottom left is the most important and I have blown it up here. You see here a double masted ship which would have been used actually for long distance uh, sea travel and uh, this relates to the belief, to the strong belief sailors and merchants and traders about Avalokiteshvara's role as a protector of sailors and mariners this is something that Pia Brancaccio and Oscar Bukirachi have worked in uh, great detail. And uh, we learn about Avalokiteshvara's popularity across Southeast Asia being related to the great belief in him as a rescuer of uh, 
traders and merchants. So not only do we know that portable objects carried Avalokiteshvara iconography to far off places, but we also learn how along the coastal port towns and the river mouths, up upwards along the river mouths, you have Avalokiteshvara shrines built uh, because Avalokiteshvara actually gained as much popularity as the Buddha uh, himself. Uh, so this is one example of how an icon, its iconography traveled and transformed uh, in, in the different regions. In fact, far off in East Asia, there was a gradual gendered transformation of the Avalokiteshvara from a male to a female Guan Yin. So, it, you know, we must remember the importance of the local beliefs and the local cultures in the ways that uh, influences were selectively chosen, assimilated, used to different purposes, and transformed. So I will now move on to an example of a narrative, and uh, of course, uh, I've chosen the Ramayana narrative to highlight uh, this aspect. Actually, much has been written about the ways in which the Ramayana has been retold, rewritten, reenacted, and refashioned across the South and Southeast Asian landscape. Uh, I'm also guilty of it, having written a, edited a book on the multivalence of an epic, which focused on uh, the ways in which the Ramayana has translocated and changed across Southeast Asia. This epic remains an integral part of the cultural consciousness and political imagination of the Asian people. The retelling of the Ramayana in different media, oral, textual, epigraphic, performative, and sculptural are of course closely interlinked. Coming to the image on the screen, which represents a detail of uh, Lakshmana seeking uh, leave from a pregnant Sita, who he leaves, uh, sort of abandons in the ashrama uh, of, uh, of Valmiki because, um, you know, Rama uh, has bid him to do so. You can see a visibly pregnant uh, Sita in a very, very beautiful forest locale. It is, it is a narrative sculpture that is part of the narrative reliefs of Chandi Brahma uh, in the triple temple complex of Prambanan in central Java and datable to the ninth century. Among those who have worked, who have done very detailed work on the Prambanan Ramayana, the first name that comes to mind is that of William Stutterheim. Uh, and uh, thereafter, Cecilia Levin has actually uh, done a lot of rereading and taken Stutterheim's work uh, forward. A close look at the iconography of the Prambanan Ramayana sculptures provides insights into the inherent change in the assimilation of varied versions of the Ramayana epic. And this includes the Uttara Ramacharita of Bhavabhuti, the Uttara Kanda of the Valmiki Ramayana, the Kakavin Ramayana of Central Java, and the Hikayat Sedi Rama. Uh, which was very popular uh, in a slightly later period, the Islamic version in Malaysia. All of these share some parallels with the mid 9th century Prambanan version in stone. And yet, none of these together or separately provide a comprehensive explanation for the Ramayana carved in stone at Prambanan. So it's, it's, there is no direct antecedent that one is able to trace. The closest is the Kakavin Ramayana, and yet 
already in the 9th century the version frozen in stone differs also in some respects from the kakavin ramayana which in turn took a lot but was not the same as the ravana vadha or the bhatti kavya uh, from 7th century vallabhi region attributed to the poet uh, bhatti so while the kakavin ramayana as i said is almost contemporary to the visual narrative carved at prambanan the hikayat sri rama which is a 16th century malay recension of the story and reveals islamic influence also plays a role now between the 9th and the 16th century of course we've lost many unrecorded oral versions of the text and the detailed processes of localization of the epic in central java uh, let's see how this pans out let us take the examples of sculptures portraying the childhood of lava and kush in valmiki's hermitage from the uttara kanda of the rama these line the inner face of the balustrade or the ambulate or in the ambulatory of the chandi brahma in prambalan so you have a temple to shiva to brahma and to vishnu and this particular part is in chandi brahma while the sanskrit and kakavin versions of the uttara kanda mention the birth of twins lava and kusha to sita the chandi brahma sculptures clearly show the birth of only one child that is lava and the creation of the other that is kusha from the kusha grass by valmiki interestingly this version that is sculpted on the prambanan temple is similar to the later 16th century textual version of the malay hikayat sri rama which also narrates the episode of the creation of kusha by maharishi kali that is the localized name for valmiki now although the version is different from the uttara kanda and the kakavin ramayana and therefore closest to the islamic hikayat sri rama we do have an 11th century version recorded in the indian katha sarit sagar so in indian folklore somewhere this version is recorded and what i'm trying to point out is a lot of missing links are lost in the oral and performative traditions of how the ramayana epic was localized in the different parts of southeast asia and these kind of inquiries then raise important questions about modes and mediums of transmission as well as about directional flows of influence does its source rest somewhere in malaysian folklore did it originate in java this is just one example of the complexities involved in the interpretation of cross cultural connections in art evidence for which lies at the intersections of icon narrative text and performance of course in their historical contexts it also brings into dialogue interrelationships between popular and classical forms of the many ramayana so it's not only uh, across space and time but also vertically between folk village popular versions of the epic and the more organized sophisticated or let's say classical versions of the epic i will now uh, go an example a very very interesting of uh, cross cultural histories of art relating to uh, icons as war trophies and for this i have chosen uh, one of the most stunning and exciting narratives of 
uh, an icon of a goddess who is uh, in the Sanskritic inscriptions of southern Vietnam, ancient Champa, erstwhile Champa, called the Bhagavati of Po Nagar, or sometimes also addressed as Po Ina Nagar, uh, or the Lady of Po Nagar. She remains in worship today. We have her earliest epigraphic corpus from the 8th century. And uh, today she is worshipped um, in this form. You can see that this is a contemporary image of the same icon. And, uh, you know, there is a big, long narrative between the 8th century and today about how this Bhagavati Kautareshwari or the lady of Ponagar was, uh, you know, vandalized, stolen, replaced, restored, and reinstalled a number of times. Uh, as you can see, the head was replaced at a much later date. And today she is in worship as Yan Po Nagar or the Lady of Po Ina Nagar. Uh, po Nagar is the present day Vietnamized name of, uh, of, of a region in ancient Kautara, uh, one of the five divisions of Champa, ancient Champa that we find in the Sanskritic inscriptions. So I just want you to uh, briefly listen to the very, very dramatic story of uh, this goddess. As you can see clearly, the hand and the, the hands and the face are uh, later additions to a stone sculpture from an earlier period. But our so the first notice that we get is in the late 8th century, 784 AD, from a stele inscription from Ponagar, where there is mention of uh, the plunder of what is called there as Surapura, that is the city of the uh, gods uh, in the Erst Ponagar of Nachang is, uh, you know, well known for this Bhagavati. Now, this inscription of 784 AD mentions plunderers from overseas. Now, we don't know overseas how far. Overseas should not immediately lead to the conclusion that it's India. It would be overseas from Java, just across the Java Sea. Uh, that describes the plundering of the city of Surapura at Kauthara and the inscriptions were demonic, dark colored people who had come to plunder uh, the Shivalinga and the uh, goddess, uh, whose food, the people who, are, who were the plunderers, their food was more terrible than corpses, according to the inscription, and who were vicious. Now, all it says is that these people are from overseas and they are enemies. And what they do is they plunder already in the 8th century. See how politics and religion are tied up here. It is the state deity of the, of the Linga and the Devi that are under attack to, to sort of diminish the authority and legitimacy of the ruler and the kingdom of the ruler that they are attacking. So in this case, the king was King Satyavarman, ruling from today's South Vietnam, the region of Na Chang. Uh, now what these enemies from overseas, these very fierce and terrible enemies as per the inscription, what they did was that they carried the Khali of Ishana and the local king, King Satyavarman, chased and defeated them, but unfortunately could not recover the linga as it had drowned in the sea. So what King Satyavarman does is, he reinstalls the lingam together with the Devi, as per Agamic prescriptions, as per the Shaiv Agamic prescriptions. This, according to the inscription, happened in 706 AD, uh, while the inscription itself is 784 AD. 
Another in now we are not sure which Devi, but the site is the same as the Bhagavad. But we are coming closer to the Bhagavati now. I mean, there is another inscription of the Cham King, that is the southern Vietnam, today's southern Vietnam, King Indravarman the first, from a site that is today known as Yang Piku and belongs to the ancient uh, part of Champa that was known as Panduranga, today known as Hanrang. That also mentions foreign invaders by sea and the destruction of a linga in 787. We get yet another inscription, this time belonging to the reign of the Champa king Hari Varman, that mentions the old image of Devi being carried by savages. So this is a memory of the earlier record that I had discussed. And that had left this very sacrosanct temple of the ancient people of Champa in Vietnam empty. And so in 817 AD, a new stone image was installed by King, uh, by a king. After 50 years, the image was plated in gold. And after another 50 years, that is in 918 AD, that since the established golden image was carried away by the neighboring Khmers of Cambodia, a stone image therefore was installed in 965 AD. So we've come to the middle of the 10th century and this power politics surrounding the Bhagavati of Kautareshwari that you see on screen continues. And so these inscriptions about her continue right up to the 13th century, where again there was destruction and replacement of the image. Now, if you look at the image parika, the iconography, and the back of this image uh, parika, the image frame, one sees that it is you know, and the way that the Devi's arms are organized, the way that she sits, there is a very uh, close affinity to medieval southern Indian representations, particularly Chol and post-Chol representations. But what period exactly this stone replica was made is unsure. Certainly, the chopped off head and the hands were replaced after the region came under the control of the Daiviyats. And the Daiviyats who pushed the charms to the periphery in and after the 15th, 16th century continued to worship Devi Bhagavati of Kautara, but they worshipped Hu Inanagar. And you can see a very Vietnamized, Sinicized way of uh, worship as well as her uh, crown, her tiara, etc., are treated extremely differently. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of how we can, I mean, we, we looked at Avalokiteshvara as an icon uh, where trade and uh, uh, religion played a very important role. Now I brought up the example of an icon where war and war booty, uh, you know, in from as early as the 8th century has great impact on uh, how icons and iconographies get localized in, in distant regions. My last rubric, and I, I hope not to take too long on it, has to do with architecture and mobility. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, Angkor Wat, we talk about Borobudur, and we talk about several other temples, say from the, the cluster of temples in Sambor Creek or, or in Mizan in Vietnam, um, you know, uh, the Mahabodhi's uh, temple spread across uh, large parts of Southeast Asia and also East Asia, including Thailand. Uh, how did architecture static and rooted to the ground reach distant places? Uh, and how do we conceptualize 
the issue of architecture and mobility in terms of connected heart histories uh, between India and Southeast Asia in the pre-modern period. Now, we do know that the sacred architectures of pre-modern India and Southeast Asia share much in common. But given that built forms are fixed in space and time, how are we to account for visually similar architectural conditions across vast distances? So my questions are, was architectural transmission limited to the trans-regional travel of architectural concepts in the form of treatises? Was it just architectural manuals and treatises that resulted in transference of ideas and forms? Or did it involve the movement of artists and artisans? Or were there other ways by which architectural knowledge spanned long distances? A closer look at the sources would help us answer such questions. And to my mind, they reveal two very distinct but related modes of transmission. The first relates to the idea of itinerant concepts, where the transference of an underlying concept or an underlying mythology assumes parallel but distinct architectural forms in trans-regional contexts. So for explaining this idea vis-a-vis -vis architecture and mobility, I've taken the concept of the Meru or the cosmic mountain in Indian thought and its articulation in Khmer or Cambodian architecture. The motif of the mythical mountain Meru as the mountain of gods, as a cosmic organizing principle located at the center so this is a tablet uh, showing the Meru. This is, of course, a cosmograph um, in, a, in a manuscript. And this is Kandarya Mahadev uh, in Khajuraho that reflects the concept of the Meru in, in the Indian context. Uh, so the Meru in terms of concept is the mountain of the gods, a cosmic organizing principle located at the center of the universe with its summit being the highest point on earth. It's well established not only in Indian cosmography, but is also a symbol of Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain cosmology. Ancient Indian literature abounds in descriptive references to the Meru as the world axis, as the central mountain with four buttress mountains, as the navel of the universe encircled by concentric rings of land and seas, the very famous Sapta Sandhavaha, as the mountain upon whose summit is the city of gods, and also as the orienting principle for the directions. These interpretations of the Meru have traveled as ideas along trade routes and have translated in the Hindu and Buddhist architecture of ancient Cambodia. The iconography of Meru in Cambodia signifies at once many levels of meaning, metaphysical, religious, and political. The system of barres and dikes, for example, that you see on the screen, these dikes and barres, uh, this is a representation of uh, Angkor Wat as Meru, uh, serves also, besides the religious and political functions, the important function of collecting and channelizing water. As the state temples of successive Cambodian kings, the temple mountains also served as ritual centers of successive capital cities of the kingdom. Indian Meru symbolism is localized in Cambodia on the substratum of its autochthonous belief in the supernatural powers of the mountain in accordance with its newly felt needs for rituals of kingship and concerns of water management. Here, it was the concept, the mental image, a cultural idea that journeyed ahead and generated newer images 
because Angkor Wat, the Kandariya Mahadev, and the Tanjavur Brihadeshwara that we see on the screen are visually, in terms of visuality, very different. But conceptually, all three are tied to the ideas of that that surround Meru. But there is another way in which architectural transmissions and transformations have happened. And these relate to the mediation of the object. Uh, so architectural imageries incised, carved, or painted on portable objects, such as votive offerings that you see on the screen, uh, terracotta ceilings to the lower right, illustrated manuscripts, I showed one earlier, miniature models of stupas and temples, uh, top left, uh, and stele engravings were carried by pilgrims, traders, priests, and monks on long journeys. Pilgrimage to sites rendered sacred by myth or history was prevalent since ancient times. Ancient Asian Buddhist pilgrimage followed the footsteps of the enlightened one, the Buddha, from his birth at Lumbini to his enlightenment at Bodhgaya, first sermon at Sarna, and his Mahapari Nirvan at Kushinagar. Bodhgaya emerged as a significant ancient Asian Buddhist pilgrimage center at least since the third century BC and remains, has remained so to the present. At the dawn of the fifth century, the Chinese pilgrim Fayan had recorded the presence of a simple Bodhi temple at Bodhgaya, made sacred by its immediate proximity to the Bodhi tree under which the Buddha had attained enlightenment. In the late 6th century, precisely 588, we know of a Sri Lankan monk by the name Mahanaman who donated towards a dwelling for the Buddha at Bodhgaya. In the 7th century, the Chinese pilgrim monk Xuanzang traveled to Bodhgaya and gave a detailed account of the Mahabodhi temple and its environs. The Mahabodhi at Bodhgaya has since seen several renovations in its long history, the most noteworthy among these being the Burmese interventions, uh, the mission by Kyan Siddha before 1093 AD and then another late 13th century intervention. Now, Bodh Gaya's rising fame in pre-modern Asian Buddhist pilgrim circuits encouraged the production of miniature models of the Mahabodhi temple, some of which I have placed on this slide. So to the left, there is a 12th century miniature, absolutely tiny model of the, Bodh, uh, of the Mahabodhi at Bodhgaya, which is today located in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. To the right, you have two further models, tiny models that were carried as pilgrim souvenirs. One of them, originally from Bihar, is now in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And the one to your lower right is at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in Los Angeles. So all of these three models are interestingly of the 12th uh, century. And they're about 15 to 20 centimeters tall. They were portable and could be carried across long distances by pilgrims. John Guy has recorded in one of his research papers at least 20 such miniature Mahabodhi replicas belonging from the 10th, 11th to the 15th centuries. And they are now located, they, they originally belonged to different parts of the Asian Buddhist world, a majority from Eastern India, but also from Nepal, Tibet, and Myanmar. Most of them are in museums abroad. And these replicas appear to have served multiple functions and carried multiple meanings. Apart from being pilgrim mementos, uh, they were also meditational aids or three-dimensional mandalas 
They were token gifts for those who aspired to but could not undertake arduous pilgrimages from distant lands. The Mahabodhi replicas also served an important architectural role, inspiring the making of at least seven full-sized actual Mahabodhi temples in various parts of Asia, built in the near likeness of the Mahabodhi prototype at Bodh Gaya. And so you can see on the screen, uh, to the right is the Mahabodhi at Bodh Gaya, which was restored in the medieval and modern periods. Uh, to the left top is the Mahabodhi replica in an actual standing Mahabodhi temple uh, in Myanmar, belonging to the 13th century. And to the lower left, uh, Wat Chetyot, Thailand, a 15th century Mahabodhi temple, uh, a near replica. Apart from there, that, you have another one in Thailand at Chiang Rai, northern Thailand. Uh, you have one in the 16th century, the 16th century at Patan in Nepal. Um, you also have uh, the Shri Gugi Pagoda under the patronage of the Mon King Dhammacheti in Lower Burma. Uh, Two Mahabodhi-inspired temples are known from the region of Beijing in China that were built in the 15th and the 18th centuries and uh, resulted from the transmission of architectural models from India and uh, Tibet. So what I have done essentially uh, is to throw open a uh, whole range of uh, ideas about how we can begin to conceptualize uh, the cross-cultural interactions, how they work out differently when the motives are different and how they are different in terms of icons, how we need to understand narratives differently and how architecture and mobility can be addressed. Uh, and how we can attempt to arrive at conceptual frames for all these categories. Uh, so that's it, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dhar. And uh, we have a uh, few questions there in the uh, Q&A chat box. I, I hope you can also see them. I will read one by one. Okay. Uh, the first one is by Dr. Uh, Kusum Thiri. What is your idea about Mani Padma? Is it is it an another name for goddess Tara, the consort of Avalokiteshwara Bodhisattva? Mm, difficult to say. Uh, we have Tara. Uh, I don't think that is a synonym for goddess uh, Mani Padma. Uh, there is uh, there is a question by Manuel. Have Gajalakshmi images also been uh, utilized or seen in Southeast Asia? I'm just trying to get the questions. So, uh, the have Gajalakshmi, yes, Gajalakshmi images have been utilized in Southeast Asia. In fact, uh, one very prominent Gajalakshmi image can be seen uh, in the meson complex on the pediment. Uh, uh, very, very prominently placed and many other places in both Buddhist and Hindu contexts. So there are uh, two questions by one uh, guest, Suraj Patak. The first one is, may I know the origin of uh, Buddha image? And the second one is also related to that, uh, when did, at which time period Buddha started to be preached in image form? Well, the origin of the Buddha image is, uh, you know, there is a long historiography attached to the origin of the Buddha image and, uh, uh, you know, whether uh, there was a very clear uh, and iconic representation of the Buddha before at the turn of the millennium in the first century AD, uh, Buddha started to be worshipped in human form uh, in India. And uh, then the debate that started between Alfred Fouché and Ananda Kentish Kumaraswamy in the 
in you know what is known as the debate on the origin of the Buddha image, where Fouché uh, studied the origins of the Gandharan style in great detail and stylistically arrived at a Greco-Roman oblique Gandharan origin of the Buddha image in at the turn of the first millennium, that is in the first century AD, whereas Kumaraswamy uh, challenged the exclusive origin of the Buddha image in the Gandhar region and spoke about also simultaneous developments in central India in the region of Mathura and uh, other places uh, from uh, first uh, from the Yaksha image to the Bodhisattva and from the Bodhisattva to the Buddha image. Uh, so uh, one can sort of go on and on about it uh, but roughly, it is the turn of the millennium from the time when you when you have the Buddha in human form. Uh, so, for example, in the stupa of Barut and in the in the Satvahana period sculptures of Sanchi, you do not have the Buddha depicted in human form. But in Amaravati, in the later phase in Amaravati, in Nagarjuna Kunda, in Kanaganahalli and also in the later uh, representations at Saji of the, of the Gupta period, you have representations of the Buddha in human form. Um, it is also interesting that the Jinnah image uh, in human form comes from about the same time period. So if there's anything more that you would like to know in particular about the origin of the Buddha image. Uh, the next question is by Manav. Uh, can we draw similarities of Meru architecture with the state formations in the Cham region of Southeast Asia? We have clearer, uh, Manav, uh, Manav is one of my own students <laughs> and we will have enough time in the classroom, Manav. But uh, we have uh, very clear indications of uh, parallels with Meru first in India. Uh, so, for example, in uh, the Raghuvansh of Kalidas, uh, you have references to the Raghu lineage of kings being compared to Meru. Sthitaha Sarvon Nate Norvi Krantva Meru Revatmana, that you know, seated right on top of Urvi or Prithvi, and in the appearance of the Meru himself is the Chakravarti king. You have references from the period of Udayaditya Varman in, in the Khmer region to Meru. Uh, in the Champa inscriptions, uh, there is a description. Uh, we were discussing the Mahavedi and the importance of the pedestal to the people of Champa, uh, where the Mahavedi itself is compared to the Meru. And the Ling is placed on the Mahavedi. So Shiva sits on Meru, right? And then uh, since the Linga is, is named the Linga of Bhadreshwara or Shambhu Bhadreshwara uh, and so on, with the, you know, prefixing the king's name. So posthumously, the king is going into Shiva Loka and therefore then residing along with the Linga on the Meru. So you have epigraphic and visual evidence there. Uh, you know, which can be related uh, through the comparison of the Mahavedi itself with the male and Kailash. Both terms are mentioned. The next question is by uh, Saijal Kaushal. Okay. What is the treatment of Bodhisattva Avalokiteshwara as a divine entity with supernatural powers mostly in regions where Shaivism was dominant Tell us about the relation between Shaivism and the form of Buddhism followed in those regions. Sajal, that's a very sharp question. Thank you for asking that question. And a very important one, because the ways in which Shaivism and Buddhism interacted with each other uh, was very different uh, in regions away from the regions of the origins of the, of the two religions. So, for example, uh, if you take the site of uh, Dongzong in, uh, in Vietnam, uh, 
it is dedicated uh, to in the patron deity called Lokeshwara or Loknatha, that is Avalokiteshwara. But the region at that time in the 9th, 10th centuries was a stronghold of Shaivism, the, what is today central Vietnam or Quang Nam province. So in Nizan, you have the Linga of Bhadreshwara worshipped, but not very far away in Dongzong, Avalokiteshwara becomes the state deity. And while King Jaya Indra Varman II promotes Avalokiteshwara worship, he does not forget to begin with uh, salutations to the Linga uh, you know, of Shiva. So the two coexist. Also, uh, let me, let me uh, sort of take you further. Certain texts, you have comparisons, particularly in the Mahayanic Buddhism and the Vajrayana Buddhism, where parallels are drawn with Shiva. So the Karandavyuma Sutra, one of the names is Maheshwara for Avalokiteshwara, which is also an epithet of Shiva. And if you look at, I, be, I wish I had a slide to elucidate it further, but if you look at the iconography of Avalokiteshwara in, um, in Champa, for example, sometimes you see like a third eye and, and the jatas and an eye accustomed to Indian iconographies would at first immediately jump to the conclusion that this is Shiva. But you look carefully and in the coifer is Amitabha Buddha and is clearly actually a representation of, um, of Avalokiteshwara and not Shiva. So Shaivism and Buddhism interacted in very interesting ways in different parts of Southeast Asia. Java has its own story. Uh, another, I think I can read it up, Pallavi, Pallavi, Pallavi Bhakti. Bhakti. Yeah. How much has the geographies and other Indian regional information transferred to Southeast Asia with regard to architecture and mythology especially? For example, are there counterparts for Ganges and Kai? Oh, yes, there are. So, um, you get terms like Mahendra Parvat, Mahanadi, uh, which are actually geographical transpositions of, um, uh, you know, the Kailash and Meru, etc., and the uh, and and, and uh, you know uh, the the sacred rivers of India, which are you know which are then located by them in their own geographical terrain. And uh, yeah, this is a very, very, very recurrent and common phenomenon happening. The, the transposition, geographical transposition of certain sacred geographies across seas. Uh, Krishna Javeri, which school of art was prominent in Buddhist art? Gandhara or Mathura? Hmm. Um, <laughs> So across Central Asia, uh, you see Gandharan art forms travel across land, uh, across Central Asia, Bhutan, Pucha, um, you know, uh, all the uh, all the way into China, Japan. Uh, Gandharan uh, Buddhist art has had a great uh, presence across. Uh, Asia and how do we uh, so, and so have the Mathura and the Sarnath schools through land as well as through sea. Now how do we say which one has had more influence? Um, not, not really easy. If you look at uh, standing Buddhas from Thailand, uh, they are so close to the Gupta period Sarnath Buddha styles. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at many of the Central Asian and Chinese uh, Buddhist iconography, it is much closer to the Gandharan Buddhist styles. But, you know, even these distinctions within India have got complicated and mixed. So Kushan Buddha images, Kushan Buddha images in the region of Mathura often show Gandhar influence also. And vice versa. So Gandhar and Mathura were connected across through trade. 
and you find their interactions as well so let us let us draw a let us keep this match a draw <laughs> the art influences seen are from north or south mm, from both certainly from both and why leave out the east bengal and bihar had a great role to play in the transmission and then why leave out the west gujarat and java was very connected uh, uh so that uh, you know even in the medieval period some of the gravestones uh were uh, uh, for uh, for the islamic period in in java were actually made in kutch in the region of of gujarat um pandyas and pallavas and cholas certainly had close contacts with uh, with the uh, maritime southeast asia including malaysia in some places you see a more direct southern influence and uh, in some other places you see a more direct northern influence so there you know the the lesson from this and the earlier question of gandhar versus mathura or north versus south versus east versus west is that actually there were no unique directional linear flows there were multiple directions and multiple circuits and also what went from india did not always directly influence uh, southeast asia sometimes it came to the filter of isolation regions so we need to understand that the flows were circuitous and multidirectional uh, also at different points in time uh, thank you devayan uh, glad you enjoyed the talk could there be any ideological similarities between varaha avatar and avalokiteshvara from the perspective of deity oh, because i mentioned that avalokiteshvara is a savior and varaha as vishnu rescues bhu devi um the, the parallel would be a bit far fetched in that the deities are always rescuing uh, their subjects but uh, beyond that the in uh, in terms of the myth or the iconography the parallels are a little distant sai Um, good evening, ma'am. My questions are: Why do we see the same name Mahabodhi in different contexts? Will you please emphasize more that particular topic, gender offerings of Avalokiteshvara, ma'am? Will you give more data about? That? So, three questions there, Sayani. Uh, Mahabodhi was an important pilgrimage, Asian Buddhist pilgrimage, and the attempt was to replicate Mahabodhi. in their own lands and therefore certainly they wanted to retain the name but not every it is called in their local languages so what chet yot in thailand for example but what they are referring to is the mahabodhi temple um the gender you see uh, it is the prime character or quality of avalokiteshvara is uh, essentially that he is the maha karunika or the most compassionate one and uh, that quality of compassion in east asia particularly china translates as more of yin where you talk of yin and yang uh, and that quality of softness of compassion etc is then compared to uh, the feminine aspects just like in ardhanarishwar you have the feminine and the male quality so there is a gradual uh, gendered transformation of avalokiteshvara as a female deity a female kuan yin in east asia by the 15th century but the process is gradual it starts earlier uh, where you see more feminine qualities seeping into even the visual iconography um artisans i have myself been looking for data for artisans in southeast asia 
uh, not as easy. Uh, we are only trying to understand whether they are local artisans or whether they are in, you know, artisans who have migrated by looking at the stylistics of the artwork and the architecture. So far, direct information about the artisans is very scarce in the Southeast Asian context. Veena Achar, I think last two questions now. Yeah. Is Urna on forehead indicative of no? no. It isn't indicative of Maheshwara's third eye. Can you elaborate on the concept of mandala in Southeast Asian art and architecture? So you have a lot of the same mandala. So Borobudur, for example, is a mandala. Uh, so also Angkor Wat is a mandala. Uh, in that sense, the conceptual uh, understandings of a mandala are very much present in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, we could elaborate on it another time, perhaps, with images, etc. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Parul Pandyadar, for uh, this wonderful talk and also patiently uh, answering the questions. I have one question. Do we have representation of female version of uh, Ashtam uh, Mahabaya in Indian context? No. no okay. Oh, you mean Ashtam Mahabaya Tara? Yeah, yes, yeah. we have. We have. We have Ashtamahavayatara, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, not not uh, not female of local like Kuan Yin, but we have Ashtamahavayatara, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much once again. And I also thank all the participants uh, for again logging in th this time. And I request again uh, to log on next month. We'll be having the talk on the same last Saturday of every month. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And again, uh, for this uh, uh, nice gesture of uh, sparing some valuable time with us. I look forward to your visit. I mean, this time we could not uh, arrange your, I mean, we could not meet. Yes, we have to. And, and uh, you came and I missed you. So we have to meet. And I'm so very happy to be speaking on at this forum and wonderful questions, wonderful interactions. Thank you, Dr. Prabhakar. And thank you, IIT Gandhinagar. Thank you so much. Thank you.